so I can't wait. Good morning to you all, and we we continue now with this second talk on the on Teresa's book of her life. What I want to begin doing this morning, just to have a look at the prologue. Because we we'll, that it will help us to maybe have certain pointers towards how we might read this book well. Very short little prologue she gives us. As I mentioned last night, Teresa, unlike modern writers, she wrote the prologue before she wrote the book. Nowadays, writers tend to write the prologue after the book is finished. So just it's a very simple two paragraphs, but as it, it sets the tone for the whole book. And she starts off by telling us, since my confessors commanded me, it's a strong word, she's commanded, she's ordered to write this book. Now we need to be careful how we understand that. There's two things going on here. One is there's a certain sense of sort of camouflage going on. Here's a woman writing in the context, the times in which she lived in. And so she's sort of, there's a certain protection here. I was ordered to write this. This is not my initiative. Someone else ordered me. I'm obeying orders in writing this. There's sort of a certain sense of self-protection going on here. But there is also truth in it. She is asked to write this. And she wouldn't have written this if she hadn't been. So she's asked or ordered or commanded or, 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 or obedient her to write this. We'll come back in a few minutes to who these people might be. And she gives us, in a very short phrase, what she's going to write. And she, to write about the favours and the kind of prayer the Lord has granted me. The favours, the gifts, the blessings that God has given to her, and the kind of prayer. That's what, she, that, that's what she's going to write about. Therefore, this is not about herself, or what she has done. It's not focusing on self. It is focus is upon God, what God has done in her life, and the kind of prayer that he has given to her. And that is a very important, it's not the type of prayer that I do, or the type of prayer that I feel drawn to, or the type of prayer that I like, or the type of prayer that I'm able to do, or anything. It's not. Prayer is what God has given to her. The prayer that God has given. And that becomes very important as we read through the book. It's what God is doing, what God is giving to her. That's her prayer. She then goes on to say, I wish they would also have allowed me to tell very clearly and minutely about my great sins and wretched life. This is something that perhaps leads to one of the many misunderstandings in this book. 
And Teresa starts speaking to us about her sinfulness and what a great sinner she is and a wretched sinner. And over and over again she uses very strong language describing her sinfulness. But never does she tell us what her crimes were. What terrible things has she done? And clearly, of course, she hasn't done anything terrible, hasn't committed any serious crimes. That's not what she's telling us here. In one of her letters, when she refers to this book, she describes it as the book of the mercies of God. And that's an important description or title that Teresa gives to this book. It's about the mercy of God. She has a profound sense of God's mercy. I mentioned last night that about to understand Teresa, we need to remember that she has the mind or the mentality or the, the world view of a convert. There's a before and an after. God has had mercy upon her. Let's just listen to a little more of this prologue here, where she goes on more on this one. So, so about my sins, they, this would have been a consolation, but they didn't want me to. In fact, I was very much restricted in those matters. And so I ask for the love of God, whoever reads this account, to bear in mind that my life has been so wretched that I have not found a saint among those who are converted to God in whom I can find comfort. For I note that after the Lord called them, they did not turn back and offend him. As for me, not only did I turn back and become worse, but it seems I made a study out of resisting the favours his majesty was granting me. I was like someone who sees that she is obliged to serve more yet understands that she can't pay the smallest part of the debt. So there's this found sense of God's gift to her, God's mercy upon her. And that's what she wants to speak about, a merciful God. God of mercy. That has mer not, not only does God have mercy on her, but she becomes increasingly aware that this is the characteristic of God, a God of mercy. And to, to come to God, we come as people in need of his mercy. And we have as our gospel today, I'll say a bit more about this when we get to Mass time, that story that was important became very important for Teresa the, the man going to the temple the two people going to the temple to pray and the, you know, the sinner or the publican Lord have mercy on me a sinner that person whose prayer was much more profound the sense of God's mercy and that's going right through this book this is a book written by somebody with a profound sense of God's mercy for her. It's not that she has done something terrible, but the, the more she meets with the loving and merciful God, the deeper her own sense of how undeserved, unmerited this is, how unworthy she is of this mercy. Okay, maybe that as we go along. So this, in this prologue, what, like any good author, even though every author hopes that the whole world is going to read what they write, to write a good book one needs to have a specific readership audience in mind. Who is the person writing? 
And one of the, the peculiarities, and here we meet it now, and I may as well say it now, we meet it in all sorts of different ways throughout this book. One of the peculiarities about this book is that Teresa never names people or places. Doesn't even name herself here at the beginning. As a whole anonymous, everything is anonymous in the book. I, I met a person, I went to a particular place, I was in a convent, I grew up in a town. Never names them. And if, it's interesting that there, there are only two people named in the book. And they are both now canonized saints. Francisco de Borgia, who was the, he was a Jesuit, the third superior general of the Jesuits, and Pedro de Alcantara, Franciscan. They're the only two people she actually names in the book. In her letter at the end, the sort of the epilogue at the end, she names Juan de Avila, who is, of course, also now a candidate, also and, and a doctor of the church, just like Teresa. So it's interesting that they're the, they the only people she names in the entire work. But who is, who, who is she writing? It is, she's very clear that she has certain people in mind that she's writing for. Towards here, my confessors. And later on in the book, she'll also speak about a, the five of us who are very close together. She's addressing very personally at times. And for certain sections of the book, it's clear that she's writing for one individual, like a letter to an individual. So the most important of these is Garcia de Toledo, Dominican. He's the one whom she is addressing quite a lot of the book to. There are a number of other confessors who clearly she is writing for. There's also a few other very close friends, part of this little group that she's writing. So she has various people in mind. She also has Juan de Avila, who was the main theologian in Spain at the time. And the book was to be, she wrote the book to be given to him. And the person who had given that order, that instruction, was the head of the Inquisition at the time, Francisco de Sota, who was a friend of Teresa's and very favourable to Teresa. He'd known her, Teresa's family, he was a native of near Avila, known Teresa's family. And when she went to him for advice, and he advised her, when you write this, Give it to Master Avila, who was the main theater. If he approves it, I'll be happy with it. So there in her mind as well as she writes this. But clearly also, she is more than that. She said, whoever reads this, she has a wider audience in mind. Anybody. All of Teresa's writings have at various times been described as being letters. They're personal. And we could read this too as a personal letter to us. She doesn't write from a distance or in, in an impersonal way. She's very personal. But there's another I don't know if I can use the audience or readership that she's got in mind as she writes this, and that's God. Second paragraph of the prologue's addressed to God. First paragraph to the readers. And this is typical of Teresa's writings, and in this book, no different. She's effortlessly switching from addressing her readers to addressing God. Directly and indirectly. Writing about prayer is prayer. Writing about God is dialogue with God. The two go together. They're part of the one reality. 
Teresa's reality is always looking in both, she's in both worlds all the time. So a second paragraph she will simply begin it. May God be blessed for it's the praise of God. It's a prayer. I finish in the prologue with Amen. It's prayer. So she's to God and to people. So, she's ordered to write this, she tells us. It's clear that she has particular people in mind as she writes it. Her purpose is to write of what the gifts, the favors, the mercies, the blessings that God has given to her and the kind of prayer that he has given to her. And how is she going to rise us? She tells us, with complete clarity and truthfulness. And that's a phrase we find a few other times in, her, in this book. She says, I am writing with complete clarity and truth, including at the very end. So great care is being taken here, good clarity and truthfulness about herself and about God in her life. And we could say that there are two reasons for this, or two objectives. Very important for Teresa in prayer, in her teaching on prayer, is what she calls self-knowledge. The more we come to know ourselves, the more we come to know God. The more we come to know ourselves, the more deeply and more fully and more truthfully we live. So writing about herself and her life with clarity and truthfulness is, we could say, a journey in self-knowledge. Teresa is going to come to know Teresa more deeply and more clearly through writing this. And in doing that, she will be living more fully and more completely and more truthfully. So this is a journey in self-knowledge, the writing of this book. But there's another objective, and that is her confessors, assessors, advisors, theologians. She needs an answer to the question, is this right? Am I on the right road? Is it truly God that's leading me on this road? Am I being misled? So writing with complete clarity and truthfulness, she's asking this question. This question is being asked. But also it's being answered. The question is both being asked and being answered in the book. Because writing it, in a sense, she's answering her own question. And at times she's going to very explicitly do this even to the extent of advising her confessors as to how they should deal with people who will come to them with these kind of issues. And she becomes their teacher. She becomes the teacher of those who are teaching her. Or another way of putting it is, she's writing the book that would have helped her, mm -hmm. the book that she needed and wasn't available or didn't exist. 
and in doing so she's writing the book that many other people also need. The book that will become so helpful to so many people down through the centuries. She's answering the question as well as asking it. But the question needs to be asked and the question is always there. So that's a sort of a second objective for this writing with clarity and truthfulness. But to get to know herself more deeply and get to know the ways of God answer this question, is this right? We come back again to the issue of she's ordered to write this. But is that really why she's writing it? And this is where the prologue Teresa is saying an enormous amount in this very short prologue. Tells us, I know too that even the Lord has for some time wanted me to do this, even though I have not dared. <coughs> so she knows and has known for some time that the Lord wants her to do this, that God wants her to do this. That writing this is a call, is a vocation. is a response to the work of the Holy Spirit in her. It is not just or merely somebody else out there saying to her, write this. It's coming from within. It's coming from that deep place within her. So it's a call, it's a vocation. And Teresa herself is a natural writer. She's a woman of words. Words are so important to her. She's only happy when she's got a new book. There's evidence that she wrote a novel when she was a teenager, maybe even more than one. She was a prolific letter writer. She loved words. <clears throat> but there's another background which is not mentioned here, but would have been very much on her mind at this time because it happened only a few years before this, is 1559, and she'll tell us about it in the book, when the books are taken off for the index of forbidden books and so many of the books that were so helpful to her have been taken off of her by all burdens. For this woman who loved books, this would be traumatic. But then, shortly after that, she hears the Lord telling her, I will become the living book for you. Do not worry. Do not be afraid. I will become the living book. So the living book isn't just Jesus. It's more specific than that. It is the presence of Jesus in her life. And we could say that what she is writing here in this book is that living book. The presence of Jesus in her life. At the time that Teresa was writing, if somebody wants to write a book about prayer, they would go off to a library and they would pull down books and they would put stuff together and they would write it in a very particular way, in a very particular style and language. Teresa doesn't do any of that. 
Not only that, but there's evidence right here in the prologue that she's distancing herself from that. And how we, how we know that is what she tells us here. When she speaks about her wretched way of life and all of that. And then she refers to these other saints who were converted to God. And she said, whom I can't find comfort. I can't find comfort in any of their stories, she said. Because when they turned to the Lord, they never turned back again. But I have turned back over and over again and become worse and worse. Teresa would have read over and over again from quite a young age the lives of the saints. Common reading in those days. And these lives of the saints were sort of hagiography. Sort of presenting these people as more perfect than perfect. When they converted, they converted and everything was right and good and wonderful from there on. And, and she said, I'm not like that, she said. She doesn't go as far as to say that these accounts weren't very truthful. She doesn't say that. But in a subtle way, she sort of tried to, that this book is different. This book is clarity and truthfulness. This is someone who has really struggled with the way of God in her life, with the ways of God in her life. There's no instant conversion here of fast track to holiness. It's a long, slow struggle. And so she's making a conscious decision here that she's going to write about Jesus and the presence of Jesus in her life, not as the books in the library say, or even the ones that were burdened have said, and the, that she still remembers. She's going to write it from the living book that is herself, and his presence in her life. The Jesus that she comes to know, or Jesus as he reveals himself to her. There's something else she's going to do, and this is probably the most revolutionary or radical thing she's going to do in this book and in all of her books. And that is the style in which she's going to write. She is, with this book, going to change the whole style of how spiritual books are written. Very point to one change in style. She's going to write about the life of somebody whom God has had great mercy upon in a way that is clear and truthful and no polishing it up in any way is not going to be like the books that people read about the saints, the saints have written. But more importantly, she's going to write about it in the language that people use. Ordinary, everyday language. Down to earth. This is for everybody. Spirituality. The profound ways of God. The wisdom of God is for everybody. So Teresa is going to write this as Teresa. As the person that she is. In a language that's going to be comprehensible for the people around her. She's, so she's right. Yes, these theologians have ordered her to write this, but she's not writing it in the theologian's language. She's writing it 
to use an ex uh, often quoted expression that she uses in her book of her foundations many years later, she's writing of the God among the pots and pans. The God who is to be found in the reality of everyday life. That's how she's going to write this. This is Jesus in everyday life. And that's how, of course, Jesus himself lived. The human Jesus. How he himself and his mother and the saints truly lived. So she's going to write this as Teresa, not as the theologian or the person who is aspiring to be like some of these saints who have written before or anything else. She's going to write it as herself from that profound place within her. She concludes the, this little prologue by saying, May this account render him glory and praise as God. Ultimately, that's, it's a glory and praise. Of, it's a prayer. A prayer of praise to God. May this account render him glory and praise. And from now on, may my confessors, and she's praying to addressing God here, may my confessors, knowing me better, through this narration, help me in my weakness to give the Lord something of the service I owe him, whom all things praise forever. Amen. That somehow they will come to know him, her better. Coming to know her better will help her. That she may give something of service, work, service. And of course, as the book goes on, and particularly the end of the book, she will see that this truly is rendering service to the Lord. So what did these confessors think then? I'm just going to give one little point from Father Domingo Ban is Dominican, good friend of Teresa's, so one, certainly one of the people she's writing for here. Years later, he'll be given the book by the Inquisition and asked to write an assessment of it, which he does, which has come down to us. And two points that he makes in that assessment. I mean, there's two things, as what the sense he's asked to assess it on. And the two questions are, one is, is this woman on the right road? Has she got it right? Is this right? And secondly, is this book suitable to give to others? On the first question, he gives a very strong yes. This woman is on the right road. To the second question, he gives a sort of a nuanced answer. Yes, the book is suitable to be read by others, but he said, by mature Christians. And what he has in mind is people who have education. Otherwise, one could misread as one could misunderstand this. We might think differently nowadays but maybe there's a certain truth in it that we can bear in mind. That this is a book for mature Christians. And I don't mean by that people who are highly educated intellectually, but for people who are taking the following of Jesus Christ seriously. This is for people who have a wisdom that comes from that. Because yes, there are many things in this that could be misinterpreted. We've got to go beneath the surface with many of the things in us. But it is a book 
for mature Christians. It is a book for the people who, like Teresa, are serious about the following of Jesus Christ, are serious about prayer, the life of prayer, people who seriously want to get to know themselves, the truth of who they are. People who are serious about coming to know the God who is present in their lives, who is active in their lives, who is relating with them. This is written by somebody whose relationship with Jesus Christ is everything, is everything for her. And that's what she's communicating. Just one final thought and I'll stop then. Somebody asked last night, and I think it was after we had finished up, when was this published? It was published in 1587, five years after Teresa's death. And the editor who published the first books of Teresa, not all her works, but most of them he published, Fray Luis de Leon, the famous Augustinian professor in the University of Salamanca. And in his prologue to his first publication of Teresa's writings, he says in it that I never knew Teresa in, the per in person. He never met her. But he said, I have come to know her in two ways. I have come to know her through her daughters and sons, whom I've come to know, and I've come to know her through her writings. In other words, the lived experience and the writing. And both of those we find in this book. Obviously, it's her writing. But also, in the midst of it, as I said last night, is the story of her first foundation. The lived experience being passed on. Teresa is passing on a living experience. This is a book about life. Writing it. She is giving life. And it's, it, br it brings us right into the two ways in which Teresa passed on life. Through her written word and through the wisdom and way of life and inspiration that she passed on to people. And that's what as we have got today. That's what we've got as we read this over this weekend we're in touch with her work and the living experience that she's passing on to us okay we'll, we'll come back to us at 11 o'clock get up again